to be on it. Fantastic. So um, it's just about 6.15. Uh, um, welcome to Plasma 2022 on Zoom. Um, this is a public lecture series and course uh, sponsored by the Department of Media Study and the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at University of Buffalo. Um, uh, I wanna begin with the acknowledgement that the land on which the University of Buffalo operates is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of Peace and Friendship, a pledge to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It is also covered by the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua between the United States government and the Six Nations Confederacy, which further affirmed Haudenosaunee land rights and sovereignty in the state of New York. Today, this region is still home to the Haudenosaunee people and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work and share ideas in this territory. Um, so my name is Paige Sarlin. I'm a uh, assistant professor in the Department of Media Study. Um, and this is uh, a series that was begun in 2014 for the Department of Media Study. Um, for those of you uh, in the public, this talk is being recorded. Um, so if you do not want your face or voice um, uh, recorded, please turn your camera and microphone off. Um, uh, Right. This year's series is curated in collaboration with Squeaky Wheel Fil Film and Media Arts Center. Um, we will put in the chat information about the rest of the series, um, in addition to a link to the recordings from previous presentations, and also the um, YouTube channel link, um, so that you can follow um, and look at these uh, talks again. Um, to be added to the listserv to re receive weekly announcements, um, I'll also post the email for that. Um, uh, a few notes about the upcoming uh, Plasma Zoom lectures. Next week, we are uh, um, really uh, thrilled to be able to um, uh, present Shawnee Michael Lane Holloway, who is currently um, having an exhibition at Squeaky Wheel. Um, here in Buffalo. Um, her exhibition is also online and there is an online component um, and a, a new project actually starting this week um, in connection with that exhibition. Uh, I will also post uh, information about that um, in the chat um, and I will encourage you to come next Monday, but also to check out her work. Um, and uh, if you want, sign up for uh, to receive five uh, emails from her over the next week, because her exhibition actually closes uh, next Monday. So um, uh, the plasma lecture is something like a, a kind of closing event for her exhibition that has been up since uh, November at Squeaky Wheel. Um, and there is an online poetry piece um, that is part of that exhibition. You can see without having to go down to Squeaky Wheel on Main Street. Um, but then I also want to call attention to uh, um, the following week, which is the 21st of February, which is when Josephine Anstey, uh, UB professor of media study, will be giving uh, a lecture and artist talk. And this is an important kind of ending moment as well for uh, uh, Josephine Anstey because she will be retiring this spring um, from teaching in the Department of Media Study. Um, and so uh, this is a kind of um, swan song for Josephine as a, um, a professor in this department. So please join us for February 21st. But tonight I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Ellen Horn, uh, radio and podcast producer. Um, Ellen was executive producer of Radiolab, an award-winning podcast and radio show for 12 years. During her tenure at Radiolab, she played a wide variety of roles from reporting, writing, and editing to directing Radiolab's theatrical stage shows. Now Horn is the co-founder of Story Mechanics, along with her husband, Charles Michelet, an audio production company specializing in podcasts, musical scoring, and character-driven audio content for apps. Um, in her role as a producer of nonfiction audio narrative, Horn is the recipient of numerous awards, 
including two George Foster Peabody Awards for her work at Radiolab, an Audiophile Earphones Award for her work as an executive producer of original content at Audible. Um, she won the Best Audio Documentary of 2018 from the International Documentary Association, and she's also won several golden reels from the National Community Broadcasters Association. She's spearheaded NSF research into what curiosity sounds like and the importance of podcasting and radio and science reporting. The list of character-driven series and audio nonfiction and, um, and narratives she has produced is extensive from pandemics, pandemic economics for Stitcher and the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics at the University of Chicago to two seasons of The Joy of X, the podcast for Quantum Magazine. Um, most notably for today's presentation, she's an executive producer, story editor, and co-host of the series Lies We Tell with the documentary filmmaker Alex Gibney for the Luminary podcast platform. Uh, Plasma students listened to two episodes from the first season in preparation for Horn's visit, um, but we'll place a link to the Luminary podcast in the chat um, and you can sign up for a free trial um, to listen to the entirety of that season. Um, a second season of that of um, Lies We Tell is currently in development. Um, uh, today I've, uh, oh, in addition, um, uh, Horn also teaches courses in audio journalism for graduate students at NYU and Columbia University. Um, but today I've asked Horn to talk about her trajectory as a maker of audio narrative um, and what issues and concerns are most pressing to her. Um, as she continues to explore the potential of audio as a creative medium. Um, so uh, without any more words from me, uh, Ellen Horn. Thanks Paige. Um, so thanks so much for having me here. I, uh, I, I'm gonna try and talk about my, um, my career a little bit tonight. I'm, uh, my production company splits time between narrative journalism and accountability reporting and um, and more innovative uses of the medium. Uh, let's see, let me get my screen sharing up. If uh, famous, you can just make sure I'm doing this right and tell me if I've got it. Do we have that black box here on the screen or is this okay? You're good. Good, okay, cool. So first and foremost, I am an enthusiast for the medium of podcasting. So I'm going to, I'm going to proselytize about the medium. I almost can't not proselytize about the medium, but um, secondly, I'm going to position my career in the trajectory of the podcasting industry. And I'm going to ask some questions about where the industry is going. So I want to start with an idea that has really shaped everything I hear. Uh, it, it starts with a study that I found about mother ease. This is an interview I recorded about 17 years ago. So I'm going to play some excerpts. And I'm playing excerpts not from the raw interview, but from the produced final version that aired on Radio Lab, in part because I'm really interested in the value of production in audio. And I want to talk about some of the production techniques here. So um, let's see. So Anne Fernald is a, she was a Stanford professor, I guess she's a professor emeritus. Um, at the point I interviewed her, this is about 17 years ago, I was a volunteer at Radiolab. I spent many, many of my first years at Radiolab as a volunteer until I finally was hired and, uh, and eventually became executive producer. I was, I was employee number one at Radiolab. Um, so I found this study that she did that looked really interesting, and I went to go see her. Um, this study she conducted while she was at the renowned Max Planck Institute in Germany. She was in a maternity ward, and she got the idea for this research because she was, she was with all these parents and babies who were immigrants, and she notices something that's really surprising to her. Of course, I didn't understand a word of what they spoke. As soon as they put the baby down, 
and no longer had the physical contact, bodily contact with the child, they started to sing almost in one language after another. A book of on the babies. Dutch. I heard these. I, I heard them use these melodies. Kusna. Russian. Kusna. To reach to reach the child, to remain in touch with the baby. Fapil. Yiddish. Fapil. So the next day, I brought my tape recorder. So what she she spends years, it turns out, uh, more than a decade studying this, and she finds this pattern, which is consistent across all languages. In every language, she's been able to study Asian, African languages. This holds true in tone languages. Um, there are four things which are always the same acoustically in the communication between parents and infants. Um, and this is like pre preverbal babies. Sorry, let's see. For example, um, I'll start with approval. When a parent wanted to praise a child, we would ask the parents to show the baby they were happy. Good boy, now you got it. Just using their voice, show them you're happy with that. Das. Acha teri gadi ke tera gadi. Hindi. Ai no sabe qual o cavalo. Portuguese. É esse, pois, é o cavalo. And what these things had in common was that the melody was a kind of a of a rise fall. Liam. Good girl. Good girl. You got it. Yeah. Good girl, sweetie. So it doesn't matter what words the parents are saying, it's always really about this melody. <laughs> so uh, I want to point out just in that last clip, the, the bass underlining, or the cello rather, underlining that, that melody. We'll come back to the production and how we made this when I finish sort of uh, recapping what her research shows. But uh, here's another thing that they found. Stop. Quite a different melody. It's short. Stop. It's sharp. Stop. Stop. In musical terms, it's staccato. Stop. And others frequently use rising pitch. Nora, look, look, sweetie. They frequently use higher pitch. A unicorn. A unicorn. And this final clip uh, really is the takeaway of of what this research added up to. This is music that is understood by infants who are just new in the world. But we all know what it means. But we all know these songs. We're used to thinking of sounds as being about something. Speech is always about something. But it feels to me more like touch. Touch isn't about something. If you whack me on the arm in a sudden, sharp way, I'm going to be startled. Or a gentle touch has a different effect. And I think, you know, actually, sound is kind of touch at a, at a distance. This concept blew my mind. The function of sound is to literally move the listener, to connect and create a physical impact in the listener. Speech is not purely about in, its encoded meaning. It carries embodied meanings. You know, the, like the literal meaning of words is only one very limited dimension of sound. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about how we made that. And, and let me also say that it almost never came to air. Krowich thought that it was uh, terribly obvious and not very interesting. And uh, while we agreed that the idea of these motheries being like touch was, was really interesting, her research, we weren't sure how to bring it to life. And so I began calling daycare centers. I posted things on Facebook or no, not Facebook, rather Craigslist. This is sort of pre-Facebook for me. Um, this was 17 years ago, and I know it was 17 years ago because one of the babies in these clips is now uh, my favorite babysitter, and she drives. So <laughs> um, I was, at the time, Jad, I was a volunteer, and Jad and I were in a small office at WNYC, and sitting next to us was a uh, woman who had newborn baby twins, and she heard me making all of these phone calls and begging people if I could come 
hear their children and hear them speak to their children in different languages. I was searching for as many languages as I could find to kind of see if I could illustrate her findings with real babies and real moms. And Eileen, the woman in our office says, why don't you come out to my neighborhood and you can record some kids. So I go out, she has a very international neighborhood and I collect all of this tape and we string it together all of the cues that she's found, these four cues in all of the languages. And you heard Crowwitch kind of in the layer on top of the babies, <clears throat> calling out which languages they are, right? But still, it wasn't that clear. It was hard to make it um, noticeable, the patterns that she was recognizing. And that's where we then brought in this cellist, Ruben, and went and added the layer of this sort of scoring to, to really point out what she's saying. Now, what I've been, why I'm playing this and what I've been thinking about <clears throat> is during the tremendous growth of podcasting that I've witnessed in my career, there is a deep divide in even what that word means. So when I, I tell people that I make podcasts, Usually they think I'm talking about this. And that's what I think. Yeah, that's so true. You know, I'm really glad you brought that up. I think this is really important. And if I can just mm -hmm. speak about this for a minute, yeah. cause I've, I've really been thinking about this quite a lot. And, mm -hmm. um, here's the thing, right? Here's when it all comes down to it mm -hmm. and we like really begin to understand, like, this is what I think. And, but th this is why we have you on. It's my opinion. Yeah. It's, you yeah. know, I really, so my friend works okay, at the New York Times. This right? isn't oh, literally nice. a podcast. Yeah. And, this um, is a, so this a TikTok a that is making fun of podcasts, there's a lot of dialogue uh, around but the subject <clears> it's pretty dead on. Really dissecting and understanding the subject. And I think what we <laughs> now, you know, I like, I get bored. I, I can't even stay listening to the whole thing, but um, when I, when I mean that I'm making podcasts, the thing that I'm referring to is a narrative podcast. And I, I know in film narrative usually refers to fiction, but I think of the kind of storytelling that I do I sort of claim that term narrative as narrative storytelling with high production values. Um, an example, you know, Radiolab is one very successful one, but probably the one that most people heard of as connected to podcasts is this. This is a global tell link prepaid call from Adnan Sayed. An inmate at a Maryland correctional facility. From This American Life and WBEZ Chicago, oh. it's Serial. One story told week by week. I'm Obviously, Serial was a moment in podcasting when podcasting got very culturally relevant and became incredibly popular. Um, the world of podcasts breaks down really into these two species, the chat show, the interview show, um, kind of in one camp, and then what I call narrative produced podcasts. Now that's not to say there's not other formats. There are plenty of other formats, but the majority of podcasts I think really can be categorized in those two, two ways. Um, and, the, and that's largely what I'm going to talk about. So <laughs> podcasting has been experiencing tremendous growth. <clears throat> so people think of Serial as the moment that podcasting went crazy. Sorry, I need to cough. Push the, push the cough button here. Um, so, but if you'll, you can see by this chart, this is Edison research and they do a telephone survey of 1500 Americans. I guess it's a, a statistically significant sample. Um, Ed Edison shows very steady growth in podcasting up to 2020. So we all wondered <clears throat> what will the pandemic mean for podcasting? Well, it meant tremendous growth as it turns out. Uh, if you include audiobooks and articles, you know, spoken word articles in, in, your, in your numbers, then that's like digital, a category of digital audio. And according to eMarketer, uh, 
they say that um, it accounts for almost 12% of our listening per day and that the average American spends one hour and 37 minutes listening to podcasts this year. Uh, and by, you know, in the next, they're going to add five, five minutes a day in the next year as an average. I don't know how that squares with you guys. I certainly listen to, to more than that, but I'm a super fan. So <clears throat> I think uh, when you look at this tremendous growth, uh, you just have to say they continue to be incredibly successful. Everybody has a podcast. Uh, and as noted, this is a, a, was a headline of a, a Guardian article where the podcast critic Fiona Sturges sort of lamented the rush of celebrities into podcasts when podcasting seemed to offer an, an option for people who were stuck at home during the pandemic. Many famous people got into podcasting. Bruce Springsteen, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Julie Andrews, Paris Hilton, Rob Lowe, Jason Bateman, uh, the, Duke, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, you know, Snoop Dogg. Everybody has a podcast. Um, and it's not only the interview and chat show. It's also audio fiction. I had a conversation not that long ago with uh, someone who was the co-president of Blumhouse. And it, at one time they were optioning more shows than anybody else. They were scooping up the rights to documentaries and fiction shows. Marcy Wiseman, this co-president of Blumhouse, told me that it's easier to get a studio executive, a film studio executive to listen to a podcast than to read a treatment. Picture LA traffic or uh, an executive out for a run with their headphones on. Podcasting is a way to get information into ears. Have you guys seen this meme? Uh, podcasts are parasocial. The listener is isolated. There's a broadcast happening here. Now, both species of podcasts, the chat show, the narrative, audio, uh, deep audio journalism, even they're parasocial. Any kind of podcast, right? The the they create this false sense of intimacy. The spoken word audio is delivered directly into the brain with headphones. That's how most people are listening to podcasts. This audio wields a profoundly powerful power. And how do I know this, or maybe more accurately, why do I believe this? In addition to being an audio producer. I am a virtual therapist. <laughs> um, I have a, a, a voiceover gig where I provide cognitive behavioral therapy in, in recordings to millions of people. Uh, this, this app, they, they, um, this company approached me while I was working at Audible. I left Radio Lab after 12 years and I went to work at Audible. And while uh, when they contacted me, I was in the midst of trying to solve the problem of why audio fiction sounds so bad to me. I find audio fiction uh, disturbingly bad, usually. Now, you'll certainly hear lots of the techniques of audio fiction throughout all of my work, but rarely am I making pieces of fiction. And it's always struck me as a strange paradox that in the rest of my media diet, in TV and movies, I'm in books, most of what I'm consuming is fiction. But in audio, I have no patience for that. There's something of an uncanny valley. You sort of wander into this strange kind of audio where it's not intimate at all. So one of the things about this app um, is that voice is central to uh, to what they're making. And they approached me and they said, we've, we've been having someone read scripts and we find that it makes people really anxious. Why is that? And I thought it was maybe the same thing that I was experiencing in audio fiction. And so we started using some of the techniques that we had first started using at Radiolab. Things like creating a little bit of messiness and improvisation or humor before very composed moments. Find that it kind of opens people up and makes them available uh, to have an emotional response to the audio. 
Now, lots of apps are, are similar, uh, and this is not by any means an advertisement to, to this app. Um, Headspace and Calm do this, uh, using a voice as the central means of connection. Uh, you know, they also use animation and other tools. But uh, Daylight is different because it's rigorously tested. It's evidence-based CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's rigorously scientifically tested. Um, I also really like that they are interested in, in creating a more equitable kind of experience and, and making mental health tools and mental health support more widely available. So we're in the midst of finding other voices and making this app available in many different voices. My voice doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. You know, uh, you respond differently to different voices depending on your own experience and point of view. The point being, the voice is a powerful tool. Just to have someone in your ear talking, you feel less alone, right? And this powerful parasocial experience, uh, it is certainly bringing lots of investment to the field of podcasting. Big business has noticed. It's a billion dollar ad industry. Now, for me, as someone who has been working on making exhaustively researched and produced stories for more than two decades, and I'm now, uh, I also teach audio journalism at Columbia and NYU, I'm interested in training the future makers of, of podcasts. I have questions about where we are in the industry. Will the celebrity chat show become the dominant form? Now I'm going to return to these business and industry questions, but I want to rewind a little bit to when I first started at Radio Lab. So uh, I was there a long time. Uh, when I when I came, I uh, the show was a curated space for documentaries. We did not make original content. Um, and one of the first pieces that really moved me and showed me the power of of voice and of of breath was this piece by Tony Schwartz. Um, this is a piece called Nancy Grows Up. Uh, it's a time lapse and I'm gonna play it. This is his niece, Nancy Schwartz. I'm taking guitar lessons and that's fun. Oops, I'm taking guitar lessons. Oh, that's the wrong clip. Sorry, sorry. Um, hold on. Well, I'm, I will direct you, I'm, gonna, I'm running a little slow. So I will direct you guys to the full, to the full piece. Um, really in, in summary, it's a little bit of audio edited uh, moment by moment every year for 12 years. And so um, this final piece, the final moment in this 12 year time-lapse montage is here. I'm taking guitar lessons and that's fun. I take drama lessons after school and that's great. And I've been working on the school newspaper. I might be editor next, next year. And I've been discovering boys. So the thing I always notice about this piece is the breath. <laughs> Santa Claus can't bring you. Let me cry. Tony, if um, the door makes. Well. Uh, are you having a hard time hearing me? Thank you. You can hear me? Okay. Open with a newspaper. Then if he doesn't do it again, he's half spoken. What do you think of the Russians sending the dog up in a satellite? Well. Are you playing? Is someone playing the. The piece? I, I can hear the oh, piece. Uh, we each had to do a piece. report on someplace. And um, okay, I'm doing a report on Hawaii. Than you are. And, we're, and we're taking notes and doing research. This summer we're going camping. And uh, in the month of July, this summer I'm going, but for the whole month of July, this summer I'm going to uh, go to Brownie Sleep. Okay, I fixed it. Uh, yeah, yeah, you. you. You should be good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, let me just make sure I'm back to go back to my presenter view here. Sorry, little little tech hiccup.
let's see. Picking up where I left off. Um, I'm taking guitar lessons and that's fun. I take okay. drama lessons. Sorry, let me just jump forward here. Okay. So, um, so that piece was really influential. The, the, for me, the sound of her breath, uh, it, it's loaded with emotion. Another thing that was really influential for me at the beginning of, of when I started making audio was uh, this book by Walter Murch, who's a film editor. There were a couple of really powerful ideas in it. The idea that there's a hierarchy of editing, that you do everything you can in the decisions that you make in the edit to preserve emotion. And he was also interested in the idea of dense clarity, that uh, layer, you should be able to layer production um, in a way where you're adding more and more elements until what you are left with is something that is both dense and clear, and that that's your goal. And that idea of dense clarity is something that's really guided me. Like I'm always trying to figure out how full can the sound be and, uh, and still be clear. So um, at the time that I started making things, public radio sounded more or less As like As you this. all know, Sunday is National Dietary Fiber Day, and we've celebrated that together for years. Yeah, and even though we've been friends for a long time, you could say our shared love of fiber keeps our relationship brand new. Okay, well, so that's not really NPR. This is actually Saturday Night Live making fun of NPR because that is totally what NPR sounded like um, and sometimes still does. But uh, what we were interested in was in using tools of digital editing, which really weren't being used. Um, you know, at the time in 2000, 2005 even, majority of what you were hearing on the radio could have been produced using tape and a razor blade. And what we had access to in was powerful digital, digital audio editing, you know, and frankly, so did the rest of the world. Like we were hearing things on the radio in commercial radio and we were hearing, you know, MTV and other things where production was happening much more densely and, and much faster. It wasn't this slow pace um, that NPR and the, and the slow tone of NPR. So um, let me play an excerpt from one of the first pieces that I made at Radio Lab. Um, this is a story that was about a, prof a professor, creative writing professor, who found this pile of old letters on the highway. And uh, it was a strange thing. He was out on a, on a trip and he and his girlfriend stumbled across hundreds of letters that had been spilled out on the highway, some from the 1890s, some from the 1940s. Um, and they noticed them because there was a goat standing on a cow's back, uh, which it was an unusual sight, caught their attention. And, uh, and our reporter had heard about these letters and heard about the um, the woman who was referenced in them and the idea that they were all seeing this reflections of this woman, but you couldn't, you couldn't know anything about who she was, was very intriguing to her. And I'll tell you, we went through 12, 15 versions of the story like that before I realized, man, I just don't care about those letters at all, unless we know who they were written to. So our reporter uh, made a trip and I introduced her to one of my uh, former co-workers and who is an amateur genealogist and they started trying to find out who she was. So I'm playing this because I want to point out the layers of production. So we just begin. What is it you want? Hi, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm looking to find information about a woman. I have no idea. House. We're new here in Napa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Ugh. The missing husband. I can't find anything on him at all. He's a complete mystery. I mean, there were a lot of unanswered questions, so we knew that we had to find Ella's obituary. Day three, the Napa Public Library. 
We're in front of the microfiche and we're scrolling through dates. It's August 22nd. This was kind of our last hope. <gasps> Look. <gasps> the death notice comes up on the screen. Chase in Napa, Monday, July 4th, 1955. We scan it as fast as we can for any new name that we haven't seen before. Rexford C. Green Milbrain. Almost right away we notice. Robert. Robert Liley. That's a grandson. There was a grandson. A grandson. And his last name is we had never seen this name before. He was listed. Hi, this is Bob. Hi, this is Carol. We're either down at the store uh, getting some milk or... We don't know where we're at, but we're somewhere. Bye. Hi, um, this is a message for Robert Liley. My name is Laura Starcheski. I'm a reporter, and I'm doing a story about a woman um, who I believe is your grandmother. Um, her name was... Uh... I wanted to hear a voice. I wanted a voice. Marina returned to Los Altos to get back to her life, and um, I waited. One day passed, then another. I didn't get a call back from him. Day six. It was Marina. Marina? Uh, she hadn't been able to stop researching. It's really sad. What is it? Well, in 1938, she filed for divorce. Uh huh. And there's a series of articles where he denies that they were married. Really? She pleaded with me to marry her. Ella did, but we couldn't get along, and I refused to do it. She was desperate for money. Mm -hmm. She needed to sell the house. She couldn't do that without divorcing her husband. Trial of sensational I'm not married case expected in June. It went on for like a year. The huge headlines. Ella said they were married. Bellman, her husband, says that they never were. Ella couldn't produce a marriage certificate, and then finally the whole thing ended with her just sitting in the courtroom refusing to answer questions. Ella A. Chase of Lomita Park, still adamant and defiant, but this time alone, steadfastly refused to answer questions. And then... And that really wasn't the worst of it. And then I found this really sad article... From a few years later. Let me find this. Christmas 1942. Death took no holiday. On Christmas Eve, Bellman Chase wandered along, dimmed out south of Market. He had been drinking heavily. He was separated from his wife and family. Perhaps he was trying to erase thoughts that come to men at such times. Christmas Day, sprawled on his back on a sidewalk, he died. The warm sun shone clear on the fractured nose and the blue bruise on his chin. Looks like the bum is dead, someone said. A couple days later, it says that his body was left unclaimed in the morgue. Really? And they were not able to locate his estranged wife. Really? Okay. So that piece, uh, you know, it, it took a tremendous amount of, of hours and work to, to make. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun piece. Uh, there's layers there of, you know, audio drama, actors essentially reading um, this incredibly pulpy, true newspaper articles. Um, there's, there's music, there's documentary sound. Uh, one of the things that we're making great use of is crappy sound. I love crappy sound. Um, I love hums and things that carry with them this information of how it was documented. These are the, the artifacts of documentation that really give you the feeling that you're hearing the process unfolding of reporting. Uh, something else that you can hear used to great effect in that is the reporter, Laura Starcheski, is speaking in an improvised way. It's not scripted. Um, you know, the improvised speaking as you're thinking it's that conversational natural tone i believe it's more easily digested than in the brain it's much older than written language spoken communication um and i think that's part of why chat shows are successful i think it's one of those things that makes 
really great audio drama um, difficult because it's all scripted. Uh, sorry, I've lost my place here. Okay, so one of the questions we had though after 2000 hours of uh, labor making that is boy, could we use our time at Radio Lab to make something that's a little bit more important, maybe purposeful? One of the things that happened in the, in the intervening years between that piece and this piece is that Radio Lab's audience grew tremendously. And with that, you know, came a great responsibility to use our production tools and, and our time to tell more important stories. So this is an excerpt from a piece that we did about the authorization for the use of military force. Now, the declaration of war is kind of a dead instrument of international law. I mean, nobody's declared war since World War II. But the modern incarnation of the declaration of war is the authorization to use force. The authorization to use force. What's called the authorization for the use of military force. Or as it's commonly referred to, the AUMF. Right. So, so way... our lawyer in the White House, Flanagan. He's given a task. Go write an AUMF that Congress can send to the president. He really has no idea. So he goes back to the last time that the U.S. did this. Last time Congress passed one of these things. He does a quick sort of search on his computer. Boom, finds it. 1991, Iraq. The Gulf War. Flanagan grabs the text. And then he copies that into a Word document, and that becomes his template. He makes some cuts, he makes some changes, he deletes some words. And then he hits send. Our war on terror, a just war. And he sets in motion this bewildering series of events. A U.S. drone strike linked to al-Qaeda. In the war, bring the troops home now. This madness that is basically the world we live in. Fifteen members of a wedding procession were killed by a U.S. And if you're like me. Bizarre, even sadistic treatment. If you're like me and you find yourself flipping through the channels, seeing the news, basically ignoring it, but then every so often thinking, wait a second. Terrorism targets in Africa. From Libya now, the U.S. Air Force. The drone strike in southern Somalia. Wait, wait, how are we doing this in all these different places? 100 prisoners are on a hunger strike. And like that. In protest of their indefinite detention. How, how, how are we detaining people for so long? You mean, is, is, that, is it okay to do that? Well, just who signed off on this, yeah. you know? And, and it turns out we all did because it was in that document. Okay, so we just made in that excerpt the process of uh, drafting legislation feel very dramatic, right? We're using the tools of production to a very purposeful means. Um, I should say we won a Peabody Award for, for 60 words, and it hinged on this interview with Barbara Lee and reporting by, by BuzzFeed. So without that reporting, without Barbara Lee being so willing to talk to us and get really personal and emotional with us, uh, that episode wouldn't have been possible. Uh, I took with me some of those tools when I, and some of those beliefs when I went to go work at Audible. And I, I'll just play you the very beginning of uh, something that I made about, you know, the, the largest financial fraud in history. The arrest of Wall Street legend Bernard Madoff. 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 Picture yourself outside in a prison yard in North Carolina. It's December. I remember it was a cool winter night. Carmine wanted some hot chocolate, and we had to go run over and see Bernie. And there's Bernie in the, in the middle of the yard at night, 7.30, selling hot chocolate like it's crack. And I remember saying to you, all you need now is a gold chain and a beeper. If you wanted to drink hot chocolate, you had to see Bernie. Bernard L. Madoff, the greatest financial fraudster in history, 
He made $65 billion disappear. That's billion with a B. And then he disappeared himself behind prison walls. The world didn't hear from Madoff again until now. Okay, so that was the opening moments. Um, I met the man who was speaking in that last last clip, Steve Fishman, when I first came to Audible, and I was told that he had, uh, you know, I met him on a tip that he had these audio recordings of his conversations with Bernie Madoff from prison. Uh, and we tried to build a series around them. And the, the first thing that we did was just, I listened to the tapes and tried to understand. And I, I found them really maddening. Madoff contradicts himself all the time and he's not you know, self-aware in any way. And they were really difficult, he has no remorse. And I thought, God, I don't wanna just hand the microphone to this guy, this is crazy. But I wanted to understand, uh, how it was that he became the center of this giant financial fraud. So we conducted another, I think, 45 interviews and, um, and collected a lot of different perspectives in the universe around Bernie Madoff and then created the six part series. Um, you know, one of the things we're doing in the setup there, this is like a story that everybody already knew, right? So doing additional reporting on it while we had Madoff and we wanted to, to really uh, use that access to tell a different side of this story. Um, we also wanted to show that the, the, the way that he had been scapegoated and made famous through the story was maybe not the right story, that the, the media image here was corrupting what was actually going on. So we're using this kind of distorted audio quality in all of the media clips um, to try and convey that, that message a little bit. Uh, let me go into another example and then I'm uh, watching the clock here. So I know that the, the students here have already heard this piece. Let me tell a little bit of the origin story. So uh, while I was at Audible, I was trying to figure out how to make audio fiction that I would want to listen to. And uh, I started talking, uh, Todd Whitney, who was a producer that I recruited and came with me to to Audible, um, Todd and I uh, started talking to uh, this under former undercover cop, and uh, we tried to create an audio fiction project that used documentary. So we did a bunch of reporting with him where we were learning about who he was, and he was telling us some of his past stories. They had the, the tricky problem of being very difficult to fact check anyway. And we had been introduced to him by his brother who told us that he was a liar and a dirty cop. So we had this credibility problem with him kind of to begin with, but found Lawan really persuasive and interesting and, give, and that he gave me this kind of view into um, the world of uh, undercover operations, which is, totally unregulated and uh, not well, uh, you know, the, the information that is available about undercover cops and undercover, the undercover process, it's, it's shocking to me that there's, um, that there's no public outcry about this. Because it's really like, you know, the, the badge protects them to do almost anything. Um, so, that's in the, in the whole piece, we go into that in this line for a living piece, which we made for uh, Jigsaw Productions. While we were at Audible, however, the thing that I was trying to work out was could I take this insight into the, this world and fictionalize it so that we could kind of shine a light where otherwise we might not get. And as I was making it, I just found that, that it was very difficult for me to orient around uh, anything other than truth. It was sort of the moment that I discovered that I was a journalist in a serious way, that um, you know, there had been clues to me a decade earlier with Goat on a Cow that I only really was interested in what's true, but that kind of cemented it for me. And uh, you know, I, I think the big question facing podcasting now is a question of 
where does the truth fit in? Um, you know, I could throw up a slide here about Joe Rogan, but uh, I think it's in the air already, right? Like, what kind of accountability is there for podcasting? I want to. I want to also show something, though. Um, I've spent a lot of time in meetings, in network meetings, and executive meetings, where the the investing company that's trying to make a podcast, trying to invest and get into this world, you know, they they want to hedge their bet. They want a celebrity who's going to bring a big audience to a project, and they don't necessarily believe in journalism's power to convene audience. Um, now, this is just a case study. Obviously, the New York Times is like the the biggest player in the in the in journalism period. So um, it's kind of an unfair thing to use as a sample. But I'm fundamentally an executive producer. I see through the lens of production. Um, I'm always looking at when I hear a podcast. I'm always hearing the process and the budget in that in that podcast. And I'm constantly trying to understand what's happening in the industry. So I just want to walk through some things here about the New York Times show, The Daily. Um, so this is their digital audience. Uh, they have reported that The Daily has 4 million listeners a day. Uh, if you look at their subscriptions to the whole New York Times, you might be surprised that the podcast carries that large of a share of their audience. Um, so you kind of wonder, well, how much money is that generating? Assume that there's three ads, three 30 second ads, um, and it's 4 million per episode, and that maybe they're selling, you know, 70% uh, of those ads out. On the low end, that's about $75,000 a, a podcast. You know, that's a 50% sell-through rate. And on the high end, that's $150,000 for 100% sold out of all of their podcast ads. So annually, that's between three and $8 million. Now, likely it's, it's actually quite a lot more. If you look at their reported revenues from subscriptions, you know, this is, they're making the New York Times, uh, is making a, a good deal. You can see the growth of the digital only subscription here on this chart. And if you look at the numbers that they've reported for their revenues for their digital audience in 2021, they made $773 million there. Now, you know, likely, uh, these per the the ad rates like the revenue that I was calculating maybe eight million of that is podcast. It's likely quite a bit higher, right? That's kind of back of the envelope numbers, and of course they don't they don't tell you exactly what it is, but um, you know the daily has a large back catalog which is all running current ads on it, and uh, they are probably selling these out at much higher than than just the bottom of the barrel rate for the industry. And they're probably able to bundle ad packages across other digital display so that they can really connect the dots between something that you hear and that moves you and something that is on your screen, right? This has, a, it has an effect of if you hear an ad and then you, you hear it multiple times and then you see it on their website, you're, you're probably, um, it's a very powerful ad package and, and can command a good price. So that's kind of the business case on the daily. Now, there's also a production case to make that part of why the daily has been really successful is just that it's, they've, they've produced it well and that they've taken elements of production seriously and have, um, have really made a uh, investment in audio production as well as just trying to translate the news to audio. The story of Harvey Weinstein was a story of patterns. Dozens of women, more than 80, all telling a very familiar and eerily similar story of abuse and harassment by the famed movie producer. 
But this week, two years after that pattern of allegations was first reported in The Times by my colleagues Jody Cantor and Megan Tu. So now, obviously, this reporting doesn't happen. This podcast doesn't happen without access to the reporting. So they kind of go hand in hand. But um, I am struck that The Daily has done such a nice job in, in paying attention to sound. Um, that episode in particular, you know, features, features the voices of many, many women. Um, it, is, it is really a, an excellent podcast, in part because it shows some pushback to, to uh, Harvey Weinstein's Like there's an amazing interview that unfolds between the reporter and Harvey Weinstein's lawyer that they include. Um, And it really shows some of the process of their confrontation with her um, in a way that makes it a really powerful moment. Um, I am running kind of slow on time here. So I I just want to kind of underscore that what I see in the industry broadly is this deep hunger for connection that there's this danger that podcasting just becomes this parasocial thing where there's an emphasis on the social, the hangout, the chat show. And then ultimately that just makes people more isolated. That without the uh, emphasis on content which makes us more connected, shows us new insights and new information that uh, deepens our responsibility to each other and to the world around us, you know, it's, it's really missing an opportunity to foster an important connection and to use this powerful tool of intimacy and audio in a way that's uh, responsible. So that, let me wind it up there. I have a whole other thing I can go into about live shows, which is a, another aspect of my career and things that I'm, I'm interested in, but I'd love to take some questions. Great, thank you so much um that was amazing um and uh yeah so let's see if there are people who just want to unmute themselves and ask you a question um or we can um uh yeah if there's people who want to just unmute themselves and ask a question um i can ask a question right away which is that you showed us the stuff about thank you so much there's so much to dig into um about uh, you know your questions about uh, the future and the financial framework, but can you talk a little bit about how much it costs to produce uh, or like the the radio lab approach? Like you said, what was it, two thousand hours of production for that first one piece, um, and and then how much did in that study about New York Times did they actually? give you a breakdown of how much uh, the daily costs per episode? So that, so the, the stuff about the New York Times is just information that I pulled from publicly available documents. Right. So that's just their investor relations, you know, quarterly reports, basically. Right. Um, you know, it is a, I don't know the cost of production. Their production team is now about 20 people. They started out with really a reporter and three yeah. producers. <laughs> um, and they, those people worked around the clock to make it. Um, and then they started acquiring a huge army of producers and they turned the show also into a radio show. So they have a, a pretty large staff, um, but like an entry level radio producer is, is making anywhere between like $75,000 a year and $100,000 a year at the, at the New York Times on that project. Wow, right. And so when you say how so, much- So yeah, 20, 20 people, you're thinking maybe they have, I don't know, the $2 million annual budget. Um, okay. Something like yeah. that. No, I mean, it's clearly with 70, $773 million, right, as the- the um isn't that what the digital total is, right yeah. like the, the, that the that's the profit right is that, or the revenue that uh you know um that's a pretty good return on on investment um <laughs> but it's also good for students to know that that's what people are also the beginning i mean that's that's it new york times yeah what about public radio 
Is yeah. That so it depends on the, it depends on the market. So I just saw a job posting for like the head of news in Ohio for $65,000. I mean, that's, that's, I think pro- going to be a tricky job to fill at that rate because it's such a thriving industry. There's so many production companies that are hiring um, that getting people with experience is really challenging. Now, one of the things that uh, broadly public radio and and podcasting broadly is more interested in is diverse voices. And so I think that that is something where um, we're seeing people who are not the traditional public radio voice, um, the not the liberal arts educated white person, uh, the, the uh, people who come from other backgrounds are, um, much more attractive in the field right now and are uh, finding it easier to get uh, opportunities and investment and additional training and education. So I think it's a really wonderful thing for the, the industry, you know, the, the ability to have more voices and more perspectives and um, really makes the content much richer and, and much better. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so there's a question here in the chat. Have I ever felt fearful about credibility in your podcasts? Um, it is, uh, I think it's something that I think about. Um, I'm, so I'm right now working on a podcast that, that is with two of my, uh, with a couple of students who I was their master's thesis advisor at, at Columbia. And it's about a forensics lab worker and, um, and a cover up. And it's an investigative series. We've been working on it for three plus years. Um, and we're in the midst of a pro- we're producing it with a public radio station in a partnership with iHeartRadio, first of its kind. Um, I think it's the first time a public media has has worked with iHeartRadio like this. Um, and the the host is a young woman um, and establishing her credibility at the beginning is really hard. You can't just say, um, you know, oh, I have a lot of experience and now I'm going to tell you about my experience and register as credible that comes off as a, in a weird way as, as bragging or, um, uh, you know, it actually, the, the more you protest, the more you claim to be credible, the less credible you sound. Um, so really what we need to do is show evidence, just show her doing reporting and show how unbelievably meticulous the reporting has been in the last, you know, over several years show her dedication and all of that, those are the ways that then you communicate that kind of credibility. Um, Okay. Do you think that anyone can get into podcasting? Uh, I do think anyone can get into podcasting. I think there are a lot of people who do podcasting as a hobby and are not that interested in the career in journalism or in, a, in the business model aspect of podcasting. So that's again to the kind of two species of podcast. As a way of social media broadcasting, who, you know, your social scene, that's one thing. And obviously anybody can do that. Um, in narrative journalism, I also think anybody can do it. But you should understand that there are a variety of roles and that one of the ways that people enter podcasting is through um, transcription jobs, getting to know people, doing production support, cutting tape. Um, just a, there are a, there's a lot of smaller pieces of labor and that need to be accomplished in order for a production team to work. If you hear the end credits of a podcast, you can hear sometimes they are very large teams. Um, so do I think you need a personality to be able to draw in the audience? Uh, I think you need to be aware of your persona on air if you wanna be on air so that you can 
figure out how to best communicate with the audience and have the audience receive, really hear what you're saying um, and, and communicate your message that way. I think uh, Alice Smith has a question too. Yeah. Um, as Professor Silent mentioned, we had to listen to the, to the podcast because we lie a couple episodes of it for class today. And when I was listening to it, there was one specific thing you said that stuck out to me You're, when you brought up that any story could be a story for the podcast and the first episode. And to me, that brought up the question that I wanted to ask you, um, how did you choose in the podcast what stories that you featured in the podcast? Did they just fall into your lap or did you have to go looking for leads to find them? <laughs> We had to go looking for leads so with that series um you know we started doing research and actually the question of like what lie do we focus on you know that i i had been recruited i it's very, i'm very transparent about it in the in that first episode right alex was driving around new jersey where we both live and he heard me on the radio and he asked one of his producers to get in touch with me and they suggested that we do this series together and at that point, it was looking for, well, you know, once we decided to do it, it was like looking for what should go in there. It could have been that each episode is a different con man or a different kind of fraudster, liar, bad person, blah, blah, blah. Um, honestly, that's just not even interesting to me. Like the idea that, um, that someone lies for financial gain or it's pretty obvious. Like there's not much to that story. You can't really wonder why someone is lying about something like that. Um, the stories that were most interesting to me were the ones that were really complex. Like, and you know, because I had been working with Lawan on this fiction thing that was just doomed, um, I knew that he was really complex and that one of the issues with Lawan was that everyone in his life couldn't believe anything he ever said because he had had this job as an undercover cop. Um, so that's a really interesting dilemma and trying to understand what drove him into becoming a cop, especially since he came from this, you know, he just had story after story of being tormented by cops when he was a kid. Um, like I found that story really fascinating. So that was one of the first ones that we produced. And then, and then I think episode two that we put together is actually the, one of the, the penultimate episode of the series, I think, um, which is about facilitated communication and self-deception. You know, like no one among us is, um, is not a liar in some way and, and often we're lying to ourselves about the things that make up our identity. Um, there are ways in which lying is really positive and pro-social. Um, you know, those little white lies you tell someone, oh, you look great, you know, that's pro-social. You're, you're not doing that out of malice. You're doing that to be friendly to somebody and make them feel good. Um, so there's lots of interesting things to say about lying, I think. Um, but the mystery of it for me was in finding these character-driven stories that would, would really make us uh, fascinated to understand how they unfold. Okay, there's a bunch of questions in here. Let me... Uh, I think Andrew was first. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi, I really like your slide. My name is Andy. So, can you hear me? I can. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I didn't know. <laughs> Because so uh, I, I I was a podcast intern last summer. So from my experience, I I realized that podcasting has a really like big. It's a it's a really uh it, it, I would say like it's a, it has a big welcoming space for everyone. Yeah. So my question is that do you think uh, COVID really opens up the age of like podcasting, and because of that, more people start to start their own podcast. Because I, I noticed that when I when I was working in Manhattan, uh, for my for for my uh for my podcast studio, 
I realized that more and more people started their own podcast just in their basement. And that's all. That's how I, and I just want to ask you what's yeah. your thought. Yeah. Um, Andy, what podcast were you interning on? Oh, I was interning on a custom podcast studio in Manhattan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was, a, I, was, I was a summer intern during that period. It was during yeah. the COVID period. Yeah. And, uh, they told me a lot about like how everybody started their own podcast and how my boss, what they, they started their own podcast in their basement. They started everything together. It wasn't, I thought, at first I thought it was a really complicated po- process, but they told me that it wasn't that hard. It's, yeah. Sorry, like it just started in the basement and everybody started to like become like this whole like new trend and stuff and people started to like uh get yeah. on it yeah I, so. I i think covid i think for the reasons that um that we are hungry for connection that's mm-hmm. and covid made us more hungry and more isolated um, I think that was one of the motivating things, but also the fact that um, digital production could happen with audio. It's, it's much more light and durable and flexible in that way, in a way that video is not. So we just didn't, you know, we never slowed down at all during COVID. Um, it, it has been something that, um, we've adjusted a little bit. We used to do a lot of travel and we used to go record things in person. You know, now I get people to record on their phone while I Zoom with them and then they send me the recording. Um, I get them to take a recording of a tour of their house while we're on, you know, I, I say, go, go look at something and narrate what you see. And we create scenes in, in that way. Um, so that kind of flexibility in the production is is really is really put podcasts as at an advantage and audio only as an advantage. Thank you. And next we have a question from I believe I'm saying this right, Key, uh, which I just reposted in the chat. Unless Key, you want to speak it? You want to read it, famous? Yeah. Oh, sure. I can go to it. Um, okay. So this is from Key. Uh, do you think that podcasting will continue to be a niche form of content creation, or do you think it will continue to expand as an art form and gain popularity? Uh, I asked this uh, because you mentioned how the NYT keeps, no, the New York Times keeps gaining subscribers through podcasting, but in my day-to-day life, a lot of people don't listen to podcasts. I personally don't listen to them and I have a hard time trying to follow them. Will it overtake radio, uh, overtake free wave radio? Yeah, so I think broadcast radio will always be around, but podcasting is definitely cutting into its share of ear. Um, one of the things that's really hard to gauge is if you, you know, if you don't personally like Marvel movies, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the world doesn't like Marvel movies. Um, so I think what the evidence suggests is that about 40% of Americans are listening to podcasts. Um, so it's not a majority yet, but the growth has been steadily climbing for 20 20- Will it further split into this one species of podcasting called podcasting and then something else and we'll get a new name for that other highly produced and, and more like the, the other thing, it has, it's more labor intensive. It takes uh, more resources to create. Will that become something with a different name? Do you, just a quick question on that. Do you know what the, 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 the bite into broadcast radio is on podcasting? Like, is there- so, Yeah, really I, could, I could have looked it up. Um, it's Edison Research does this amazing, um, it's called the Infinite Dial. It started out as a radio report and they did radio research and, and they publish it every year. And it's fascinating to look at how um, you know, are we listening on smart speakers? Are like, what's happening? Or how 
our connected cars. I mean, 10 years ago, people thought connected cars were gonna be a big deal in radio. Turns out not so much. Um, you know, there's, I think the podcast on demand listening has just been this like behemoth. You know, it's like a steamroller through all their research. If you look back over the last, you know, 10 years of, of their report, you just watch it growing and growing. Next, I think we have Matthew Luke. Hi, Alan, it's nice to meet you. Hi. My name is Matthew. Um, my question is, um, what is it that um, podcast personalities can offer that um, radio personalities can't? Oh, great question. Um, gosh. Uh, post-production? <laughs> I'm not sure that there's much that's that different. There's two things. Um, you know, FCC rules mean that you can't be seen on the radio. Um, so podcasters are not governed by the FCC. Um, there's more possibility there um, to, to be more obscene, basically. Um, I'm not sure that that freedom gets you that much, but it gets you something, you know, if you're a believer in freedom of speech. Um, radio, because of the business model, I think, and, and what supports the radio business model as it shrinks, you know, it used to be that everyone would listen to the radio for the weather. Now, all of us have a device that tells us the weather much more accurately than what you're hearing on the radio. So what it is really good for is um, kind of state level, city level accountability reporting and um, civic engagement. But anytime there is a, I mean, I, I live in, in New Jersey outside of New York City, man, every hurricane, every weather event, the importance of the radio just, you know, it is, it is like a shining beacon on the hill for everybody in New York when we lose power um, or when something happens. And I think that it will continue to be that kind of um, water cooler, hearth, you know, civic center. Um, but it may not be the center of audio innovation. I think that's going to move to podcasting pretty exclusively. Thank you. And next, I think there's a question from uh, uh, is it Christian or, or Kirsten um, that I posted. Yeah, you had it right with Christian. <laughs> All right, well, take it away. <laughs> so my question would be, what for you is a single most important element to a podcast? And that one element, whatever it may be for you, is that going to save something on its own or does it need to be added to by other elements of the podcast? Do you need to build there or can you have that one thing and build down from there rather than up to it? Hmm. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, uh, what I tell my students well, I think I'm, I'm going to try and do that thing where I just dodge your question. I don't know why I would have to choose just one thing. Right? Oh, yeah, but so, feel free to choose multiple. I mean, if podcasts are many, many things. Yeah. I had a feeling it wouldn't come down to just one for you. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's really about the, the, the deep, salient engagement of information by using emotion. Um, so if it, if it doesn't have information that's probably the most important thing for me the information on its own has to be valuable um you can't really layer production on top of something that has no meaning whatsoever and end up with it having meaning i can really answer all right thank you <laughs> Awesome. Uh, next, uh, Jeremy had a question. Um, you're on mute. Okay, cool. 
Hello. Hi. Jeremy. It was very interesting listening to what you had to say. Um, I have a question about since podcasts, a lot of the elements are interviewing some people, interviewing people, asking questions. Do you think eventually, uh, due to COVID and everything, podcasts will eventually overtake talk shows? Um, what do you mean? What what kind of talk shows? What are you talking like, about? I'm gonna show. I'm just give example of the Late Show with Jimmy Fallon. Mm. Since a lot of times it's a lot of like interviewing guests and everything, and a lot of podcasts people bring guests on to interview and talk about a topic. Do you think eventually, with COVID going around now, even even with COVID stops, do you think eventually uh, um, podcasts will take over talk shows, the form of talk shows? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think that that form is a form that has an audio equivalent that's pretty one-on-one um pretty similar so do i i don't know that they're in direct competition you know the the late night shows are variety shows that employ some other things some other forms as well music and um you know jimmy fallon for example they're they play games and and things like that there's like stunts um so i think that kind of entertainment content on tv um has been a pretty durable form that's been around for a long time. All right, thank you. Yeah. Awesome, well, next up is uh, either Kay or Kai. Um, I posted your comment, but if you wanna read it, you can. If not, I'm happy to read it too. Uh, here, I'll read it. My question is, what is the future of podcasts in this era? In the past, most of our parents would use the radio to listen to news or sub story, but our generation may be more exposed to media such as video and text, like this all audio format I've never been exposed to before. Also compared to video and text, where is the charm and advantage of podcast reflected? Okay, um, so I guess I didn't sell you on podcasting is what I'm getting from your, from your message, but um, give it a try. Uh, I, one of the things that um, people really appreciate about podcasting is the ability for it to not be so greedy of on your, um, on your body. (laughs) I can do things, commute, exercise, fold laundry, um, you know, there's a cook while I'm listening to podcasts. Um, And I think that that is a great advantage The other thing that is uh, really amazing about podcasts is um, that it's not a, it's an active medium. It's not a passive medium. So it it does require you to listen closely and to co-imagine what's happening. You know, your, your sound goes in your ear and into your brain. And in order for it to really land and register, you are having to actively engage and picture things um video is like full-on assault of your of your whole senses and you can very passively sit back and absorb what's coming at you um and in fact sometimes it's it's hard to to move away from the control that the image has over you but that is also one of the great advantages of audio that um I don't believe in the tyranny of beautiful people. I think normal looking people and even unattractive people should be allowed to have a voice and should be considered. Um, And I think that there's a way in which we have terrible biases through our eyes that we actually don't have in such a, a distinct way through our ears. Awesome. And a question from uh, uh, Madison Anderson. Yeah. Hello. I- I'm so happy that you're here. Thanks. It's really fascinating learning about everything that you do. And I mean, as someone who has been interested in podcasts and like being a voice for a while in storytelling in multiple different forms, I mean, 
you're saying that you worked for Audible and you've just been doing all these things. And you also said that you were talking about a time where you kind of were learning that you, you're, I'm a journalist. Like, wow. Like, how did that feel for you to finally come to that realization? Yeah, I, what I'll tell you is that um, in part, I didn't come to that quickly because my father's a journalist. And so my, my understanding of what that meant um, was sort of defined. He's a print journalist who worked his whole career for the Washington Post. Um, so I think I thought of it as something that was different than what I do. And what I do is very production intensive and is about theatricality and um, emotion and, um, and weaving all these elements together. And while I was at WNYC, you know, even as at Radiolab, we were taking on more and more serious stories. I still would look across at the newsroom and think like, those are the journalists. We're like storytellers over here. We're creatives. Um, and then I was recruited to Audible to come make original content at Audible. And, and then I found that I was in an environment where what they cared about was celebrity and, um, and moving units. And, uh, and the, the, the values that I had were far more traditional journalism values. So I was at Audible for three years. Um, I found the way that they marketed the Madoff project was uh, enraging to me. Mm -hmm. um, they, we wanted to market it in a way that really focused attention at the questions we were asking and to what extent Adolf himself had been a scapegoat. And, um, and Audible chose to use the tagline, Madoff Speaks. And the, the degree to which I was upset by that was really the moment that I was like, okay, why, <laughs> why does that bother me so much? Um, and, and that's, I think, when, I, when it, it started to dawn on me. But it was also this experience of really failing, actually, at trying to make audio fiction. Like, I just couldn't care about a fictional plot didn't make a bit of difference to me. Um, we could make things that sounded good, but they were empty. And, uh, and, and that really started to kind of head me in the, in the direction of like, okay, I think journalism is really where, where my heart is. Let's take one more question. Thank you, Madison and thanks, um, Ellen. But let's take this last one from Tenzin, yeah. Hi, Ellen. Um, so something in the first episode that struck me was, um, I think either you or Robbie or Alex said how dark corners don't encompass people's truths um, because it is a true statement, but also because it was a statement that evokes sympathy for these people. Um, and I've also observed that your language remains concise and how your primary sources shape your narrative. So I was wondering what the process is like in terms of your choice of language or editing or sounds when you want to acknowledge that these lies are not the entire story without letting too much subjectivity or emotions inform the story and what you've learned about finding the balance between subjectivity and- Oof, Oof. that gets into really thorny, thorny territory. So first of all, you're so right that the, the um, primary sources and primary voice, voices, the interview is like the central unit, the you know foundational unit of everything that I do and what I make. Um, uh, being concise is, is, you know, you're always balancing what's best for the listener. And I think being concise is really about not wasting their time, being efficient. And um, there's something that always happens in the edit where if you remove things that are extraneous, the, the, the center of your idea becomes much stronger. So, um, so yeah, I think um, I am always trying to find the best way to, to put the voice kind of in the center. This was a really complicated question you're, you, you were asking and I was having all these different thoughts. I'm not sure I've answered your, your question entirely. Um, the only thing I think I wanna 
add to it though is a is about the extractiveness of journalism that that's been something that's been really bothering me lately and that i'm interested in unpacking and in um trying to figure out there there is this way in which standard journalism ethics has said i am the journalist and i decide and the source is just someone who gives me materials so that then i have the power over and you don't you don't share decision making with your sources it's not collaborative in any way and um and i think it's kind of not true that it's not collaborative um and I think journalism traditionally has been really bad at sharing power with its sources and that that's there's, there's a reckoning coming on that if it's not already here. Um, so I'm interested in exploring different ways of partnering with sources. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I think uh unless there's some pressing question i think we've taken up a lot of your time thank you so much for all of your thoughts and um uh this is really wonderful and uh um definitely encourage everyone to come back next week for shawnee holloway um but thank you again ellen that was fantastic and thanks so we'll, much uh, we'll have your um uh students will be responding to your talk Great. and with more comments and thoughts on on what you had to say. So thank you. Thanks so much. Okay.